How much do you think from a marketing standpoint and just brand awareness and understanding of the industry that you have found this industry has grown? Yes, it's only been six months, but have you seen big growth knowing it's getting more and more conversation, especially in the media, like for example, with Biden mentioning it in the State of the Union address, like this is becoming more and more top of mind. Do you see this cannabis industry one day like alcohol when it comes to marketing opportunities, like 30 second ads in the Super Bowl? Because let's face it right now, there's a lot of restrictions when it does come to the space. So when it comes to marketing right now, how challenging is it knowing your background getting your message through to consumers with all the restrictions. And then to my original question, do you see it one day opening up to like what alcohol is? Hey everyone, thanks for checking into our latest Trade of Black podcast. Hope you're all doing well. Big question that we have pertaining to the cannabis industry as it starts to emerge more and more is if and when big alcohol will enter into the space. We're seeing more and more executives from the alcohol into the industry pivot over into the cannabis industry. Why? Well, let's face it. Look at consumer trends and the growth of this space. To find out more when big alcohol will come in, let's welcome in actually a former alcohol executive, and he is the chief marketing officer of Merrimed, which trades on the OTC and the CSC under the ticker symbol MRMD. Jay O'Malley, back to the podcast. It's been about six months, but good to see you again. How are things? Great, Chad. Great to, great to see you too, and uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah. So last time we had John, lots of conversation, as I said, off the top with your background. Uh, yeah. One thing I wanted to start out with first is probably to say, like, in the last, you know, six months since I've seen you last, uh, how much do you think from a marketing standpoint and just brand awareness and understanding of the industry that you have found this industry has grown? Yes, it's only been six months, but have you seen big growth uh, knowing it's getting more and more conversation, especially in the media, like, for example, with Biden mentioning it in the State of the Union address, like this is becoming more and more top of mind. Yeah. And, you know, you can you can sort of pick it up anecdotally, just talking to friends, um, a yeah. nephew who's in grad school um, talking about the Biden, literally telling me about Biden's speech last week. As That's interesting. Spend time together and just the knowledge right. of the can of curious, the can of potential, those folks that are in there's this huge group of people just interested in getting into cannabis or learning more about it. Um, and we're seeing that grow every day. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's really exciting. There's a groundswell of folks that I think are ready for this industry. And just as as more brands advertise and more brands start to educate consumers, it's exponentially growing. Do you see this cannabis industry one day like alcohol when it comes to marketing opportunities like 30 second ads in the Super Bowl? Because let's face it right now, there's a lot of restrictions when it does come to the space. So when it comes to marketing right now, you know, how challenging is it knowing your background, getting your message through to consumers with all the restrictions? And then to my original question, do you see it one day opening up to like what alcohol is? Yeah. So I'll answer the second question first. I, the answer is yes. I, someday we will be there the same as alcohol is today. I don't know if that's one year, five years, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and no one does. But but it, I know it will happen. I hope it's one of our brands that has the first Super Bowl commercial. But either way, when a cannabis brand makes a Super Bowl commercial and it airs nationally, I will be happy because that yeah. means as an industry, we've legitimately arrived right that's like the pinnacle of marketing uh which would be great and you know but right now yeah it's a challenge it's yeah. it's a challenge but it creates opportunities it creates opportunities for companies that can innovate can find good partners can use good creative media uh but when google meta and a and the fcc nationally have all of these restrictions you know, you're kind of operating with one hand tied behind your back when it comes to trying to reach the consumer. Uh, but we're all the all that matters is that your competitors, um, you know, our competitors, we're on the same level playing field and we are. Yep. So we're all yep. playing by the same rules. And that's no different than if we were over in beer right now. Yeah, you're still playing by the same rules or just different rules for that sport versus our sport. Yeah. No. So, well, I had your chief revenue officer, Ryan Crandall, on about a week ago, and uh, he talked about just, you know, um, Betty Zetties, you know, that's a state leader when it comes to edibles. It's re-entering into the Illinois market. So how do you maintain and like, you know, what's been the feedback, I guess, as far as, you know, from some of the consumers knowing that it's re-entered in the state and they just the opportunity it presents within the state of Illinois? Yeah, the feedback's been outstanding. You know, we're two, two and a half months in getting going. Um, particularly buyers and bud tenders, they really remembered the brand from four or five years ago when it was last yep. there. So they were really excited about it. 
they become our lead salespeople telling their their customers as they come into stores, whether it's our stores in Thrive, Illinois and Southern Illinois or um, any of the other wholesale retailers we're going through, you know, those bud tenders really become our leading sales team because they really enjoy the brand and remember it. Um, but from a consumer standpoint, we're not taking anything from granted. We're not treating it as, oh, they'll all remember us and just be thankful we've come back. Like we're treating it as any other new market launch. We're doing our advertising, our brand ambassadors out there are, you know, hand to hand selling it to consumers. Our sales team is doing everything they can to drive the distribution. So we're treating it like we would any other market, yeah. but we definitely have that sort of incremental momentum and excitement um, being back in town. Well, I, I'll bring something up. Uh, I remember probably like 10 years ago, they had the cast of Goodfellas on in an interview. It was the 25th anniversary of the movie. And one of the reporters asked Ray Liotta, why do you think so many people resonate to this movie? And he said, because it's good. <laughs> and that was pretty much telling it like it was. It's so. Awesome. I think when you talk about having like a competitive edge in markets, the first question is, is whether it's good or not. And I would think that, you know, as I said, with this edible based on feedback, it's good. And that's probably the number one reason why it's, you know, you have your competitive edge and continue innovation within that state. Is it not? You know, and that's why I chose to join Merrimed a year and a half ago, leaving Boston Beer Company is Merrimed. We make amazing products. Okay. And if you start with amazing products like Betty's, that it's good, it makes everything else a hell of a lot easier, right? You know, you still got to build a brand, you still got to do the work. But when you have a product that, you know, nine plus out of 10 times, you hand it to somebody and let them try a sample of it and they go, oh my God, this is delicious. Yeah. And then they wake up the next morning and they say, I had the best night's sleep I ever had. The next sale becomes pretty easy because that person's going to go tell five people. Yeah. And so concept. that's all about product quality and great flavor, great taste, great effect. So, yeah, I mean, that's I think and I think that goes across our whole portfolio. But Betty's is certainly, you know, a shining example of that. Let me ask you a little bit about your background. Like you left alcohol, was working with Sam Adams. Did you have well, opportunities with various um, uh, cannabis companies within the space? Like why Merrimed? Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, Merrimed was kind of a unique situation in that, uh, a former coworker of mine at Boston beer is here. Um, ah, and okay. we were talking and I got to, over time, I got to meet Ryan Crandall, Tim Shaw, the whole team. And, uh, it was the right time for me to think about a change in my career after 20 years, you Makes know, sense. I was ready for something new. And when I met the whole team, including John Levine, it was like, I felt like I was home, but, but like you know, with family still, because they have the same passion, the same care about the quality of the product, the same drive to be, you know, super successful in what we're trying to do with our mission um, and really cared about the same way Jim Cook cares about um, making craft beer sort of the pinnacle of what great beer is. These guys care about making cannabis first legal uh, and nationally available and helping the consumer understand you know, all the benefits it can bring to them for yeah. whatever needs they might have, including recreational. Um, and so, it, you know, it just felt like a natural spot to come. So, no, I didn't meet with other cannabis companies. This was a very unique situation that um, came about from just a lifelong of great relationships. That's a trend that we see a lot. A lot of executives with big alcohol coming over to the cannabis industry, you know, knowing your background and where you used to work, how much do you think these companies are following the space right now? The beverage companies following? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Close. I mean, you know, between <clears throat> Constellation, Boston Beer, some others, they've got investments up north of the border in Canada. So they're looking at it. I, you know, I guarantee you the folks at Pepsi and Coca Cola and others are thinking about it and just monitoring it. Um, because it's, you know, it's a, it's, it is going to be a major CPG market uh, yeah. and industry. It's, it's, it already is, but it certainly when legalization happens it's going to be a significant industry um, and it's going to be one that they want to play in and be a part of. And yep. they will change how the industry operates at some point because of their efficiencies in what we don't get to participate in right now, which is, you know, cross state um, inter interstate commerce. We, we don't get to do that. They get to do that. They have multi-tiered systems of manufacturing, delivery, et cetera. So, 
they will get into it and they they will you know for the right companies they'll make the industry stronger because they're going to bring a whole lot of logistics and infrastructure to the industry so i think at some point they'll help you know move it forward quite quickly you imagine people that get into this industry for the first time in 15 or 20 years and you try to talk about interstate commerce and what you had to navigate in the early days that'll be so foreign to them but yeah i i agree crazy yeah dream for those days. Look, right now, there's only seven states remaining that have not legalized both medicinal and recreational. That's how much growth this industry is, you know, rapidly growing. We look at growth states like Maryland of last year, incredible sales that you guys, uh, you know, placed in Ohio, you know, big opportunity later this fall is it's, you know, expected that adult use begins, you know, in either September or October. But I'd be curious, like, with some of the states that are you're involved in that's strictly medicinal that flips to say adult use like what are some of the key factors that you take in you know when it comes to marketing when a state does flip to adult use knowing that like i said this industry was built on the medicinal angle now it's all about cpg yeah i mean you almost have to treat it so uh, let's take ohio because that's going to be a major one and obviously the other one we're a part of is delaware which also later this fall or early 25. good point um but you, you have to treat it almost like you're entering a whole new market because okay. you have lines of delineation between, um, you know, the amount of milligrams per serving and per pack size you can have. Um, you And you have a whole new. Con- so from a product side, you, you have to almost create a whole nother separate product line or at least more SKUs at different ratios. Um, and then from a consumer standpoint, it's a whole nother consumer. And you have now you have your, you know, aperture open to essentially everyone 21 plus is a potential consumer. And so as opposed to marketing on, you know, quality, but price and convenience and the things of, you know, just trying to get existing medical patients to choose our brands or whether that's retail or product. Now we have to introduce cannabis and become educators again and start to introduce new consumers to why our brands might be a great entry point for them into cannabis and then ultimately be a great product for them to you know enjoy whatever they're looking for their recreation or sleep where where do you begin when it comes to something like that i know that seems like basic information that people may assume in this industry but it is so far from it yeah um we start with our brands you know take a brand like betty's Um, most consumers new cannabis consumers these days are coming in through edibles Um, whether that's a chew or a brownie or even a beverage sort of under the edible category most are coming in through there so we start with those brands and a brand like betty's that's high quality it's a very approachable brand it's sort of uh, witty and fun and easy to think about um and the flavor is so great and there there's no major there is no cannabis flavor in a product like betty's so it's just a very approachable brand and it's an easy brand for us to educate the consumer on sort of what cannabis can do for them because Betty's is set up based on effects. And so as we talk to consumers and learn, you know, I just want to relax at the end of the day. Oh, we got that for you. I want to mm-hmm. sleep better. We have that. And as it, it's just an easy, low dose um, opportunity for a consumer to experiment or try cannabis for the first time. And like you said, the Ray Liotta, you know, <laughs> it's just good. And when they okay. try it for the first time, they, oh my God, this is great. And then from there, they might explore into, you know, lines like Bubby's. Maybe eventually they'll get into in house or nature's with vape or something like that. Um, but that opens up sort of the doors for them into cannabis and brand. So we start with brands that are easy to approach. Yeah. Well, Ryan was actually saying your vape uh, is selling incredible within the state of Illinois. So when it comes to product portfolio, yeah. like, are you seeing any trends as it relates to consumers buying up from like say value to mid tier brands, like some of the MSOs just report in their latest quarters? Yeah, we are. We're seeing it both in our brands and in our retail stores, like from a retail standpoint, our AOV is holding, you know, pretty steady this year, which is great. Um, as dollars for the consumer are getting tighter, uh, we're seeing them choose to spend those dollars on higher quality. And it's funny. I'm reading a book from the Patagonia founder right now and his, okay. One of his quotes that really stuck with me is every time there was a downturn in the economy since 1974, when they launched every downturn, their sales have grown Hmm. and every other major CPG has struggled with sales. Patagonia has grown and he attributes that to you have less disposable income, 
but you're going to spend that disposable income on something that's going to be better for you or last longer. And so when I think about, you know, our products, Bubby's, Nature's Heritage, Betty's, et cetera, uh, you know, you might say, all right, I'm, I'm going to buy a less total products, but I'm going to buy better products, products that taste better, that make me feel better, that I'll enjoy more. And so from our standpoint, you know, we're seeing consumers definitely trade up um, and start to really brands are emerging in this, you know, two years ago, it was much less about brands and more about either tack level or I want flour and I want right. or sativa or whatever. As I've seen a huge difference, but I think a lot of it has to do with the emerging uh, like female demographic is massive from where it was yep. 24 months ago. And yep. let's face it, uh, wives or moms are usually the decision makers in the household. But as soon as you have them hooked, you know, and it's, you know, a new lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, I think it really starts to take off outside of the, uh, you know, people that were involved in it from day one. But, you, you know, for it to grow, you've obviously got to expand into new audiences, right? Yeah, 100 percent. And that's not unlike a lot of other CPG segments, including beer. You know, female purchasers were usually a higher percent of the purchasers whether that's because they do the shopping or they're going to try something for the first time. And then husband, boyfriend, friends get, you know, get excited about it and the volume increases. So yeah, it, it just, when you go from medical to adult use, you get so I know. such a wider aperture of consumers you can reach, which is fun. It's exciting. You mentioned off the top, just with regards to your nephew, uh, you see some of the consumer trends right now, especially with, you know, people that are of age over 21 yeah. that are in university and you see the amount of alcohol consumption and it's trending down like fast. And right. obviously this industry is growing. You also see, I think more for the older generations and boomers, it's more towards medicinal. I could be wrong, but what are you seeing as far as like contributing? I think a lot of the growth opportunities in these demographics that I'm, I'm outlining that uh, you're seeing firsthand uh, that kind of backs up what you're saying, like how two years ago it was here. And now here we are today with more and more people becoming, I think, educated and aware of like what the industry is. Yeah. And I think the common denominator between, you know, whether it's older folks, younger folks, where is the stigmas coming down? Right. Yeah, and and that's the biggest driver of it is if it's my my parents in a retirement community in Florida, they're all talking about Betty's and so how do we get it and where can we get it? And what's, so, you know, et cetera. And it's something fun for them. And it is. You're right. It's more on the medicinal. Oh, it's pain or sleep or whatever it might be that's helping them out. The younger um, the younger generation just doesn't they, they grow up like not drinking as much. You're right. It's, I, I, I have I teenage daughters and I'm not even worried about it. Um, and so they're looking at cannabis as a healthy alternative from a relaxation and sort of more recreational use standpoint, as opposed to specific health benefits they might be looking for. But there's no hangover. There's no weight gain. There's none of this other sort of negative. And I'm not I didn't leave alcohol because I'm negative on alcohol. I, you know, still very much appreciate great beers, enjoy them, wine, et cetera. And I don't Nothing think cannabis will ever replace it, but it's certainly <clears throat> another sort of um, product that you have within that relaxation and enjoyment space. The only thing guaranteed in life is time that changes. Everything changes yeah. over time. And I think that's kind of like what we're at. We're seeing a lot of changes in society. It's the way it works done. Where's the global currency as far as the US dollar within 10 years? You know, does Bitcoin become a major currency? Like there's all these things that I think are going to see drastic changes as to how we operate and what we're interested in. And I think we're already in it. And it's just a matter of like, you know, how much it does change. We don't know, but there's going to be a lot of change over the next 10 years. I do want to bring up to when it comes to adding a new brand to your portfolio, at what point does the company decide to add a new brand to its portfolio? And like what considerations, I guess, influence that decision uh, when you make that decision? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, we, we try not to add brands too often because it takes a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of energy to manage a whole new yeah. brand. So we're always looking for white space, right? Like what do we think, where do we think there's opportunities for products that don't exist right now? And that comes from two areas. First is consumer driven. You know, we're hearing from consumers there's a need that's not being met. We'll go and see if there's a real marketplace there. And the other side that I think is every bit and equally important is 
what what would we want that we don't have right now just as the manufacturers you Good know point. we're all big parts of this industry so if we think of something cool and that's kind of where vibrations came from oh my god how cool would it be to have a product that's in a stick pack that's easy to carry that's a beverage that came from inside um you know our own four walls so between those areas, we find some white space and then we look at, OK, is that is there a real market opportunity for us and, and should we do it? And then the next level of question is, would this fit under any existing brand? So, example, ice cream. When we started a partnership with Emac and Bolio to launch ice cream a year yep. ago, we fit that under Betty's as opposed to creating a whole nother brand and just leverage the strength of the brand of Betty's. Um, but as we look to new products. We will hopefully have two new brands potentially coming out this year and a little early to share what those are yet, but uh, those will be new brands because they don't naturally fit under any of our existing brands. Well, it's kind of like when I hear you say that, you know, a lot of companies want to jump into like so many different markets. Now yeah. it's all about producing profit. And the same thing can be applied towards your products. We're focused on what you have and do it really well. I think in the early stages, because right. let's face it, we are still early and people are still learning a lot. So if you have something that people like and want, then obviously that's where your you know branding and marketing tailors around. But going back to what I said uh, earlier, with all the restrictions, like uh, how does your marketing plans, I guess, differ from product to product when constructing you know the brand's portfolios, knowing the amount of restrictions that you know you do have? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. And it's um, it's a little bit of a challenge, but, you know, we, we've got a robust portfolio of products from flour to edibles and, and they appeal to different consumers. So first of all, the messaging on and how we message and talk about nature's heritage and talk about the quality of the grow and, you know, everything from sort of seed to soil to <clears throat> ultimate cultivation, you know, all of that matters to that consumer. Whereas something like a Betty's or a Bubby's, it's flavor, nostalgia. So you're definitely messaging and talking about the brands very different, uh, differently. And then it gets down to, okay, do we need to drive awareness sort of top of funnel or conversion more down? And what channels are even available for us to do this? Um, and there's a lot that we can do in the digital world. And that's where our partners come in and help us drive the reach and, and sort of the targeting of specific consumers. We're, to the extent we're able to, we are, we're, our marketing is as data-driven as it can possibly be, yeah. understanding where are consumers coming from, where do they live, what's the demographics, and then, and then we'll create and tailor our messaging. And that's the beauty of digital. You can have a lot of different messages out there targeting different consumers. Yeah. Whereas, you know, traditional television advertising, the cost to make an ad, you can't have 50 different ads. I was there, my friend. Yeah, and that's that's probably the last thing that people want to see in today's day and age when it comes to marketing is the 30 second or 60 second ad. But what right. is good is developing an 850 pound brownie and peering on Jimmy Kimmel. That was a heck. That was one of the greatest market, probably maybe the best marketing. That was, awesome. strategy. That was all Howard. It was a brilliant idea. Uh, he he's and, you know, even our 280 Boston Tea Party this past summer, you know, that was, that was more on the brand, more about the company. But again, like just generates. So there's all these creative things that we can do to generate reach like that and get get awareness. Um, but the fun thing about this industry, and this is not unlike how craft beer developed. Ultimately, there's enough cons for our brands. There's enough consumers coming into dispensaries every day that we have yet to reach that if our brand ambassadors are standing in there doing pop-ups and educating in a one-to-one -one yes. basis, that still is the best, most powerful way we can bring in a consumer to our brand portfolio. And again, when they try our products, that's <clears throat> five new consumers we're going to get when they tell their friends. Yeah. So that well, word of mouth is most powerful still. It's marketing in 2024. You have John's expertise to find out, you know, with his background in corporate real estate to find out what locations will thrive, which he's very, yep. very good at. And once you have those locations in place, you get the consumer in. It goes back to what we said with Ray Liotta, make sure the product is good. And then obviously with the digital concept, you collect data and you create different ads to different people. And that's what you find out what works and what doesn't. And that's marketing 101 in 2024 moving forward, right? Right. Right. And in some ways, because of the restrictions, it is that simple. You know, I know. People make a great product and work hard selling it. Yeah. Tell me about it. Well, I've often said this, like when I was in traditional television and why we launched what we did, it's just like, 
you bring executives on and I saw it firsthand, three and a half, four minute interview. And then you got to cut to a 30 second commercial break. And then all of a sudden you come back and there's a new guest. Right. How can you, what can you accomplish in that time frame? But right. uh, last thing I'll ask you, uh, working with Howard, Howard's got quite a background. I remember being with him in Boston last year and he was talking about some of the projects that he used to work on in the past, including remember the, for some of our viewers that are a little young, but there was an incredible commercial back in the nineties with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird when yeah. they played the horse game. Yeah. He put that whole commercial together. So he's got some really good innovative ideas, including, like I said, the uh, obviously appearance with Jimmy Kimmel, but yeah, he is a New York guy. How do you guys get along with a Yankees fan knowing you're all from Boston being Red Sox fans? How I knew I wouldn't work? get through this without one sports question. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep them in an office all the way down at the end of the hall so we don't have to hear them talking about it. Make sure you show this part of the interview to John. But uh, yeah, yeah, you guys, honestly, as much as you're a publicly traded corporation, uh, I think it is important. I think it is really important for investors and people watching this that it feels very much like a privately run company that is very tight. And uh, let's face it, if you don't get too many cooks in the kitchen and just focus on your product to make it good, that's all a consumer wants. Like hear what we yep. want. And if you're delivering to them, then you're bound to be successful over time, right? Yeah, that's the recipe. And you're right, this uh, this company every day and you walk into the office, it feels more like, a, or any one of our grow facilities or retail, every time I walk, it feels like you're walking into family. And, yeah, and that's what right. makes this place so special. And there's, I mean, I say this in all honesty, there's no ego. It's just whatever I can do today, whether that's clean the floors, build something, go there, do that. People just jump and do it because they yeah. know it's the right thing for the business. And that's why, like for me, I'm so confident in Merrimed's future, both on the retail and brand side, because we've got great products, we've got great brands, and most importantly, and the only thing you can't ever replace or do without is incredible people, and that's this company. Yeah, takes time, right? But yeah. at the end of the day, it's why I love this industry. Everybody that's in it now, they don't like it, they love it, and it's everyone you talk to. Because, yeah. you know, from a business standpoint, from an investment standpoint, we saw in the early days, like how big valuations were in this space. And uh, let's face it, you know, stocks have been hit hard over the course of the past two, three years, but we get rescheduling announced. We get institutions interested in coming in. Yep. Why people are interested because they think valuations will one day be achieved where they were back in the, you know, four or five years ago. But you know, the difference now is there's a lot more people that uh, I think see the emergence. There's real dollars being created and uh, fingers crossed, if we get some sort of announcement in the next couple of months of rescheduling, it'll become mainstream news. And then from there, a lot of the day to day stuff that you're doing uh, will suddenly all make sense as to, you know, what you've been working so hard on. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And in the meantime, until that day comes, we just keep working on building everything as strong as we possibly can. So we get to, you know, enjoy the benefits of the change in scheduling and safer banking, whatever else comes along beyond that. <clears throat> Just got to educate these politicians. We're doing that in a couple of weeks, but uh, send me some Thank questions. You. Let me know. I will for sure. I promise. I have a lot. <laughs> I think that's the biggest response I get from everyone. How much time do you have to uh, speak yeah. to these guys? But uh, anyways, it'll be fun. But listen, always a uh, pleasure catching up with you. Let's keep in touch and uh, tell the team we say hi. And more importantly, keep up the great work. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Great to see you too, Sean. Cheers. Thanks, Jay. What is going on, everyone? What'd you all think of the interview? Did you like it? Leave some comments below. This industry, it's heating up. So if there's any information that you want us to cover off, we will do it. As this industry builds up more and more Ravenna, we want to be here for you. and We want to take this viral. So make sure to smash that like button, click on that bell for notifications, and please, as usual, we wouldn't be here without you if you didn't subscribe. We appreciate it. Thanks for watching.